I'm Emily Chang and this is the best of Bloomberg technology where we bring you all the week's top stories in tech coming up. The iPhone 10 is here featuring an edge to edge screen facial recognition and no home button. The price tag thousand bucks. Plus Waymo gets the green light. A U.S. appeals court clears the way for Alphabet's Waymo to go to trial over claims that Uber stole trade secrets. Waymo CEO breaks down the case in a Bloomberg exclusive. Plus, another Bloomberg exclusive, the Blue Apron CEO discusses the transition from unicorn to publicly traded company, life after an IPO with shares down 40%, and the meal kit company's strategy for fending off growing competition. But first, to our lead. Apple ushered in a new era for the iPhone Tuesday at the new Steve Jobs Theater in Cupertino, California. CEO Tim Cook unveiled a suite of new products with the much-anticipated iPhone 10 grabbing all the headlines iPhone 10, the most advanced iPhone we've ever made. The incredible new design, face ID, true depth camera system, and more powerful technologies than we've ever put in an iPhone before. It really is the future of the smartphone. Apple also rolled out an updated watch with cellular connection and a TV set-top box that supports higher definition video. We spoke with Bloomberg Technologies Mark Gurman and our editor at large Corey Johnson to get their first impressions of Apple's new products. It's really hot. I mean, it's a nice phone. It's really cool, edge to edge. I, I, I'm, I'm sad that it doesn't go on sale to November, till November, you know, as a fan of the product. And also for, from an investor perspective, too, that misses a whole quarter of sales. So it's going to be interesting to see. But yes, it's, it's, it's nice. Uh, you know, in terms of the product itself, you know, it is light, it is small, especially if you've been carrying an iPhone 7 Plus. Uh, the other thing that struck me was the height of the screen. You don't have to scroll so much to see what you want. And, and and the facial recognition technology is key. Yeah, I actually was able to set up my own face when enrolling my face, and you twist your head around like this twice. It's quicker than putting in like five fingerprints. I, uh, I feel like uh, I was the first person outside of Apple to enroll my face in Face ID because I, I didn't see anyone else trying to do that. But it's a quick setup process. It works really well. If you have a Touch ID app on your phone, it'll automatically convert on the 10 to a Face ID app. So they integrated it really well. And like you said, the screen is taller. You can see more video and, and text. It's nice. So, Corey, I know you'll be getting your hands on one soon, I'm sure, but curious from your perspective, you know, looking at the big picture, how big of an upgrade cycle do you think this will actually be given that 80% of people who are going to buy this phone already have an iPhone? Yeah, uh, obviously the, 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 the biggest change in iPhones ever was not having a phone and to having a phone that happened 10 years ago. But uh, I, I think that, you know, the it's a, it's a big upgrade cycle that they're facing an opportunity there for. And one of the things that Apple has found over the years is that when people, uh, when they upgrade from an iPhone, they upgrade to another iPhone. They are, it is a system in which they tend to stay. It's an ecosystem in which they tend to stay so that they don't lose. Whereas when people uh, uh, leave an Android device, they quite often will switch to an iPhone. So over time, they grow that larger and larger. And the time between buying phones has been growing longer and longer, which suggests that this upgrade cycle could be a very big one for Apple. But the question is, are the users, you know, the unanswerable question, we can sit here and speculate, and we certainly will, but the unanswerable question is, will the consumers really feel the need to get this new device? So these, these bells and whistles, and the bells and whistles that are seen in an obvious way, not something you experience just with your phone, but something you experience when looking at your neighbor using a phone, is the thing that are going to help them sell this phone. So that edge-to-edge that -edge thing that Mark was just mentioning, the, the, the facial recognition stuff, those might be uh, a, a, a more pleasant experience for the user, but it's something that the person who has yet to upgrade is going to see and may respond by making a purchase of a new phone. Right. It is a significantly different new form factor, new design, and interesting, several analysts have suggested to me that it might uh, discourage people from buying the iPhone 8. Uh, why would you buy it if you could just spend a little more and get the most expensive phone? I was speaking to Gene Munster uh, of Loop Ventures, who was here at the event, and he said, nevertheless, it's going to be a home run. What do you think, Mark? Talking about the 8 as well as a home run? or The, the 10. The 10 is going to be a home run. I agree with that. So what does that mean for the 8? The 8? <laughs> 
I don't know why anyone would buy that. In fact, they did something that I was a little surprised about. They raised the price. So the starting price before was 650 Now it's $700. So now you're about $300 between uh, the 8 and the, the, the 10 And you look at that in terms of dollars per month because a lot of people are doing these installment plans now. That's probably 5 $6 more a month. So I don't see why people would you know not get the 10 if you're on an installment plan. And I think that takes us back to why the delay. Why is this not coming out until November 3rd? I think this phone could have come out next week alongside the 8. But how many would there be available in an Apple store? Maybe four or five of them. But if they wait, they have more capacity. They build up. Now that they announce, they have more people working on They can bring in more factories. So I think they're saving up for a big November 3rd launch and, ha and trying to have as many of these phones as possible. And it's going to be available in many more countries on November 3rd than it typically is on the first day, correct? That's right. It's a, it's a lot of waves happening at the same time here. With three new phones and multiple countries per wave. So it's a big expansion of the iPhone. I want to talk a little bit about the Apple Watch. Uh, they really emphasize the health features of the Apple Watch, the sports features. They actually introduced the watch uh, with a surfer uh, wearing the wearing the watch while riding a wave and getting a call on, on, on the watch. Corey, obviously I know you are obsessed with fitness trackers. Apple said today that this is now the most popular watch in the world. That, that's their numbers. But, but what's your take on just how much bigger a product category the watch can be for Apple? You know, the iPhone watch was launched with a I don't know what people are going to do with it business plan and they threw a bunch of things out there and they wanted to see what would stick um, uh, you may remember uh, Dr. Oz was there when the day that they announced the watch uh, and, and, and we got to cover that event and uh, they, they have always thought that health was going to be a part of it but what Fitbit figured out was that really it was fitness that drove uh, the sales of their devices the fitness trackers and indeed the Fitbit Blaze uh, watch that the, they've had a lot of success with that product again focused primarily on fitness so it seems that Apple's really figured out that as much as they thought fashion was going to be a part of their watch that fitness is in fact the thing and certainly showing off the waterproofing capabilities that other competing devices don't have uh, in a very in a very big way be it paddling and I'm, I'm all for the paddle board the paddling I'm a big fan of the paddle diva and why wouldn't you be but also uh, uh, surfing and swimming and everything else Right. Well, if you're in Hawaii, if you're in Tahoe, if you're in the water, apparently it works. That's what they say. Uh, let's talk about the Apple TV set-top box. They demoed uh, the box. They demoed the 4K capacity. Of course, you have to have a 4K TV set to enjoy all of this. It is impressive, but not if you don't have a 4K TV Okay, so you asked me, were there any surprises earlier? Okay, this was actually a big shock to me. The 4K video, if you have 1080p videos in your iTunes library, they're actually going to convert those for free to the 4K video content. That is not something I would have imagined Apple would do. They would typically try to, you know, it's a different video uh, quality, offer both, charge more for the higher end. But they're actually upgrading them, and then when you buy it new, they're actually going to charge the same price that they would charge for a 1080p now that you would pay for 4K. It's a great thing. Bloomberg's Corey Johnson and Mark Gurman there. And Mark did rush into the demo room right after Apple's keynote presentation, got his hands on the new iPhone 10. Take a look. We do have one more thing. We're here at the Steve Jobs Theater at the new Apple Park campus. This is the iPhone 10. You can see it has the almost bezel-less screen, edge to edge. There's a little notch up here for the 3D face recognition sensor. You can see on the back, it has a glass back now. Stainless steel edges. This thing looks really nice. This is the OLED screen, which really makes whites and blacks and other colors just pop out. You can see the time in the corner here. They sort of split the status bar bottom charger and this has the wireless charging on the back as well. Overall the screen is 5.8 inches so it's a little bit bigger than the screen uh, than on the iPhone 7 Plus and the, now the 8 Plus but overall this feels like it's about the size of an iPhone 7 and iPhone 8 the smaller phone because of the super slim bezels all around and I know uh, people have been asking about the side button it's a little bit longer now you can hold it down to activate Siri I'll show you that here also double click for Apple Pay you can see there now to go home as we reported you just swipe it from the bottom and you can invoke multitasking as well in there and just swipe uh, between different apps and the cool part about it is that the larger screen you can see so many more text messages at once and it, it's great for video as well the iPhone 10 goes on sale November 3rd after pre-orders at the end of October starting at $999 for a 64 gigabyte model and there's also a 256 gigabyte version as well
Technologies' Mark Gurman there giving us a first look at the new iPhone X. Coming up, President Trump has blocked a Chinese-backed investor from buying a U.S. chipmaker on national security concerns. We'll discuss what it means for relations between the two countries. Plus, we speak exclusively with Blue Apron CEO Matt Salzberg. His thoughts on life post-IPO and the meal kit company's strategy for fending off the competition. Next, this is Bloomberg. Social media is now a, quote, red-hot focus of special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation into the 2016 election and possible links to President Trump's associates. That's according to U.S. officials familiar with the matter. Mueller's team of prosecutors and FBI agents is zeroing in on how Russia spread fake and damaging information through social media. His team is seeking additional evidence from companies like Facebook and Twitter about what happened on their networks. Last week, it was revealed that Facebook had discovered about $100,000 in ad spend connected to fake accounts likely run from Russia. Well, President Trump has blocked a Chinese-backed investor from buying Oregon-based Lattice Semiconductor. It is just the fourth time in a quarter century that a U.S. president has halted a foreign takeover of an American firm because of national security risks. The spurned buyer is Canyon Bridge Capital Partners, a private equity firm backed by a Chinese state-owned asset manager. Our editor-at-large, Corey Johnson, spoke to Bloomberg News reporter Ian King about this story. A very, very small company, billion and a half dollars is nothing in a market cap for a company like this. They make um, what are called FPGAs, a uh, programmable type. Programmable of chip. logic. That's right. So um, these are the kind of chips that, that a company can use, whether it's an automaker, a refrigerator maker, a cell phone maker, and, and they don't have to actually design the whole chip. They can just make the chip do certain stuff for them. Yeah, I mean, these, these, these chips have traditionally been used when you actually design another chip because you map it out using an FPGA, see if that works, and then away we go. We know it works, then we. So wait, so you, so you, so you use this because it's got a lot of functionality, opera, uh, uh, optionality. That's right. You can change and then you specify function. a chip once you've done that. That's correct. Yeah, you could change its function after it's been locked down. And, you know. This doesn't seem like, I, you know, it's all complex in semiconductor yeah. technology. It doesn't seem like really complex semiconductor technology. Yeah. No. Um, it's, I mean, this is a company, is obviously not a large company. The product itself, you can argue, could be used in various ways that could be put, you know, u useful to the military and so forth. But really, that's not what we're talking about here. Um, what we're talking about is a sort of broadening of the CFIUS purview of a, cha you know, of a change in policy in, in Washington and a hardening of the stance in Washington towards China. Really. Is it, in other words, if France was acquired, a, a French-backed venture capital firm or a German-backed venture capital firm yeah. or might not face the same sort of uh, uh, pressure? Um, that would apparently be the case, yeah. Um, so uh, as it relates to this technology in and of itself, is there the suggestion here that somehow there could be um, embedded ability to monitor the use of these chips, that if, if a Chinese company, government-controlled company, could somehow see what's happening with all these chips right. if they were uh, disseminated through the marketplace? I mean, there, there, there is an element of that in that FPGAs are also used in networking, in networking. equipment. Quite, I think it's yeah, about 25, 28 percent of revenue last That's year right. for this a, company. A lot of the baseband, the base stations that are on phone networks have FPGAs in them that control various functions and can be updated. But it's, again, I, you know, I want to stress a bit quite clearly here. Of course, security is the stated reason. Of course, security is the reason why we look at these things. But fundamentally, the U.S. semiconductor industry, the U.S. government, does not want China coming in and taking those key capabilities away from it. Now, who else competes in this area? Well, Intel with Altera. You remember they bought Altera a couple, yeah. a couple of years ago for a lot of money. Uh, Xilinx is the and, other and, one. And, the, and the Altera business was a lot more focused on networking and also a lot bigger, right? Yeah, I mean, both Xilinx and Altera basically divide the market up between them. You know, the company we're talking about here is a bit player. Is there a notion, because I remember when the Altera deal went through, mm -hmm. there seemed to be a suggestion that FPGA was being used in a lot more stuff than it used to be and that that might continue. As, I, I thought of it at the mm -hmm. time as sort of an FPGA chip was kind of an accelerator into, yeah. a, into a networking chip. Yeah, I mean, they, 
you know, this has always been the argument that these chips have had a specific use case, narrowly confined to communications for a long time, but also even more narrowly confined to the design of other chips. Um, and the suggestion was that they're going to spread, they're going to get into data centers, that people like Microsoft are actually using them in their data centers right now. So that is happening, but not very quickly. It's not so much the market opportunity, it's how these chips can be used. And I think a broader point here is we've seen the chip industry consolidate massively over the last couple of years. Right. As you know, we're down to 60% market share for the top 10 companies. That, you know, essentially the market has shrunk like mad. China needs to get into that industry. It doesn't have anybody in that top 10 is the largest market for semiconductors, was going to throw a lot of money at buying its own expertise, buying its own way into domesticating the industry with things like we've seen today. How is it going to do that now? Uh, it, it, maybe it's not that important, but it yeah. seems that it would also limit the ability of, of all the other semiconductor companies to get higher prices in the market with the notion that there might be a Chinese bidder out I there mean, somewhere. And that's exactly been it. If you're a company like Lattice is, sub, sub scale basically, what do you do, right? Everybody else is getting together. You you haven't been bought, and you can't buy anybody else. Uh, that, that would make sense. Where do you go? I mean, the, the the sort of one haven was supposedly all of this money that China right. had, you know, said it was going to spend. That'll come through. That'll be our our rainy day fund. Not yeah. looking like it's going to happen. Our editor at large, Corey Johnson, there with Bloomberg News reporter Ian King. Well, coming up, why we may see self-driving trucks on the road before autonomous taxis. We will hear from the CEO of Alphabet's Waymo next. This is Bloomberg. This week, a U.S. appeals court cleared the way for Waymo's lawsuit against Uber to proceed to trial in October. The autonomous car developer claims Uber stole trade secrets for its self-driving cars. The judge declined Uber's request to send the suit to arbitration. The case centers around Waymo's allegation that engineer Anthony Lewandowski, a former employee of both companies, took thousands of proprietary files from Waymo to Uber. The judge also ruled that Waymo will get access to a key piece of evidence, a report that aimed to scrub Lewandowski for any of Google's proprietary information and examining Uber's acquisition of his company, Auto, for $680 million in stock. Corey Johnson spoke with Eric Newcomer, who covers all things Uber for Bloomberg News. Super influential uh, engineer at Google's self-driving car company, Waymo, leaves, starts this self-driving trucking company called and you're like, Auto. And all of us are like, Self-driving trucks? All right, what? What's that all about? Yeah, there's a whole message around like, you know, it's monetizable sooner or whatever. But but yeah, then Uber sort of buys them pretty soon, I think less than a year after he left Google to become sort of the central. So they buy the, the auto trucking company. A very small team. But they're not actually pursuing auto trucking at all. They just want to go back to automated Certainly, cars. Certainly Uber's focus is, you know, self-driving cars. Right. And they put him in charge of their self-driving car effort. And then, you know, Waymo uh, digs around to see if they've, you know, any of their trade secrets have gone with him, and that that's basically the basis of this. And so, uh, Uber wants arbitration because why? Well, because they don't want it in public. There are lots of embarrassing details that could come out. I mean, their arbitration claim—it's easy to say this now—looks like looked like sort of a stretch, and they lost. I mean, they were basically saying that, you know, Waymo should be bound by its agreement to arbitrate things with Anthony Lewandowski. Uh, even though they're only suing Uber and not Lewandowski in this case, they have a separate so private they tried, arbitration. They tried to take with. their arbitration clause, the arbitration clause that, that uh, Alphabet had with Lewandowski, right. and say, oh no, that applies to us <laughs> exactly, too. Exactly, right. Lewandowski yeah. happens to be our nickname. Yeah, exactly. Which is yeah. sort of laughed <laughs> off. So, that, so now the trial happens. Right. And we're going to get some discovery, of course, it's surely been going on already. But uh, trial in October seems real soon. Right. And there's a, there's a key other ruling here, which was that. You know, bef Uber sort of suspected that maybe there would be issues, so they did all this diligence and had a cyber forensic firm like look into everything that Lewandowski had, and that report has sort of been tightly kept. Uber has refused to give it up, sort of didn't even mention it in the beginning, and finally a judge has said, "Okay, you need to hand that over to Waymo." So it'll be very interesting to see what that cyber forensic firm's said because we really haven't been able to turn up these 14,000 files. Like that was the explosive claim at the beginning of this suit that right. there were all these files that Uber had and so far Waymo hasn't been able to say there they are on Uber's computer. Bloomberg's Eric Newcomer there speaking with our editor at large Corey Johnson. 
And sticking with Waymo, CEO John Kravchik was on stage at the Bloomberg Sooner Than You Think conference at Cornell's new campus on New York's Roosevelt Island. He spoke with Bloomberg senior executive editor of Global Tech, Brad Stone, about when we will get self-driving cars on the road. I think the answer literally is the name of this um, conference. Um, it's sooner than you think. Um, we've been working on this um, at Google and now at Waymo for over eight years. Um, we've driven well over three million miles. Um, we've started to talk a little bit more about some of the simulation miles that we're driving right now, which are even more important. Um, and last year alone, 2.5 billion miles in simulation. Um, we're the, to the point now where the technology is feeling mature and ready. Um, which is why we're spending a lot of time, in particular in Phoenix, but also in Mountain View, um, in something in Phoenix called the Early Rider Program, where we have actual families driving around in our cars and we're getting to understand how real people and real families would like to use this technology. I think that's the last part for us, understanding that as we continue to refine the technology before we're ready to deploy. Well, yesterday was an interesting day in terms of another piece, which is the regulatory framework. Right. Uh, Transportation Secretary Elaine Cho uh, put out a sort of vision strategy statement, uh, call, calling it Vision Strategy 2.0, which you know some consumer groups criticize for taking a little bit of a hands-off approach, allowing manufacturers to test their driverless cars on highways. And then on the same day, the NTSB came out and said highway regulators need to be more active, pointing to the, cra the unfortunate tragic crash of a man uh, last year in a Tesla. Um, you know, wh where do you see the regulatory environment right now? What are your concerns about taking this tech forward safely? Mm, it's a great, great question, Brad. So um, if you look at what the administration has done and what we've seen in DC out of the last couple of weeks, really, it's, it's very encouraging for this technology because we are in the early stages, right? We really haven't served our first users yet. So it makes sense that we're careful and flexible so that we don't unnecessarily or inadvertently squelch innovation. So I think um, you know what, what we've seen in the House, um, which is something pretty special when you think about it, how many things have the House of Representatives united behind recently? I can think of none other than self-driving cars, right? which passed uh, a bill recently that's, um, I think, very supportive and in line with what we saw from Secretary Chow. Um, so I think that's great. And you know, I do think it, it, it bears reminding everyone that there's a difference between the problem we're trying to solve, which is fully self-driving, and removing a human from the car and letting our sensing and our technology and our compute do the whole driving task. Um, and the, the different problem that's trying to be solved today with driver assist technologies. And so there's a difference between those things. Right, and that's what the NTSB was ruling on, Correct. right? And, and I mean, are, are, are drivers getting a little too comfortable with some of these technologies, oh, taking their eyes off the road? Like, is, what do you see as the danger? So it's the fundamental conundrum that, that we face in this space. And we learned it at Google um, prior to becoming Waymo back in 2012. We had um, a pilot experiment where we put some of our employees in some of our self-driving cars for highway use. And we told these very smart Googlers that they had to be very attentive, that we were going to be watching them with cameras in the car, and if they didn't behave and keep their eyes on the road, we were gonna take this free car away from them. Um, we ended up having to stop that pilot experiment after just a couple of months because those Google employees couldn't stop taking their eyes off the road. They very quickly came to trust the technology too much. And that's really the fundamental conundrum of the driver assist technologies. If at some point the car needs to ask the human to pay attention, you need to take over, and the human has fallen asleep, gotten distracted, is in a very deep conversation with someone, that could be a big problem. Waymo CEO John Kraftchik there speaking with Brad Stone. Coming up, Equifax is still reeling from a massive data hack that may have impacted anyone in the U.S. with a credit card. Can their insurance policy come close to covering the damages? And what are they doing to stop the bleeding? And a reminder, all episodes of Bloomberg Tech are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV. Weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the best of Bloomer Technology. I'm Emily Chang. 
Well, the massive Equifax data breach could be ranked as one of the largest breaches in history. The hack may have hit 143 million customers, and a class action lawsuit filed in Oregon is demanding up to $70 billion in damages. While the company carries an insurance policy for situations like this, it reportedly only covers 100 to $150 million. We spoke with Phil Quaid, Chief Information Security Officer at Fortinet and former chief of the NSA Cyber Task Force, about the hack. I think what it means is that the company is doing is due diligence to trying to figure out what happened, what the extent of the breach would be, and what they need to do to uh, address the uh, address the victims that that breach. To include probably cooperating with local with uh, law enforcement to uh, to get to the bottom of it. That said, in Europe, there's, there are laws against not reporting things like this faster. I believe you're required to report data breaches within 72 hours. I mean. Wouldn't that make more sense so that the hackers don't get so much of a head start? Right. Uh, we, we might be talking a little bit about apples and oranges there. Uh, I think, of course, what you're, you're talking about is the European regulation called GDPR, which is uh, designed to bake in privacy protections for, uh, for uh, clients, for uh, companies that handle personally identifiable information. The, uh, the approach in the Europe versus the United States is a little bit different. Where we here in the United States, we tend to, our economic and governance model is more one of um, market forces, with perhaps the end of that continuum being uh, legislation. So, more specifically, here in the US, we go from uh, market forces to public outcries to executive orders to regulation to legislation. And that's the continuum from sort of minimum to harsh. In the European Union, I think they start a little bit closer to the regulation part of that continuum, and there are indeed some hefty fines if you uh, have massive breaches of private information, up to 4% of uh, global revenue. Bloomberg spoke with Senator Dick Durbin, who said, we are duty-bound to step in on behalf of innocent citizens who are going to pay a price, adding, this is an indictment of our current level of regulation when it comes to this industry and others. How do you respond to that? I think there is a role for uh, for a government, be it the legislative or executive branch, and at a minimum, trying to incentivize companies to uh, to uh, avoid the false choices. What I'm talking about are false choices between uh, convenience, privacy, and security. You know, I want all three as a consumer, and the best uh, architectures and the best systems can indeed provide all three. So what? do you imagine investigators are doing right now? Explain what's happening behind the scenes. Sure, they're looking for, uh, they're looking primarily at forensics. And uh, hopefully, uh, just as importantly, they're looking to the future. They're looking to see what types of strategies and techniques and technologies they ought to be implementing. Things like uh, really good segmentation, both at the macro level and micro level, so that future breaches scope are limited. They're also looking for, uh, looking for solutions that implement what I call uh, defense in depth. So rather than relying simply on point solutions, they might have a bunch of automated solutions working together over security fabric. And quite honestly, I, I'm guessing that they're looking very closely at what's the best way to communicate, communicate with the private sector since so many people were affected by this breach. So, you know, uh there are reports that this was possibly accomplished by exploiting certain networks that other major companies are based on. What is the likelihood that many other companies could be at risk of the same kind of attack? It's quite possible. We don't have, uh, we collectively don't have that specific information yet about what the point, the point of the original breach was. There's one company who stepped forward who said that uh, we think it might be us, and in fact, this is software that's used in 65 of the top 100 Fortune 100 companies. So, but what we don't know, though, is that whether it's a zero-day exploit of that particular software package or something that is, in fact, uh, there's a patch that's been released. So it's important for us to understand that, yes, there's a point of entry that they came, the, the perpetrators came in through, but there's likely other points in the network that where the network, uh, layered network defenses didn't quite live up to what was necessary. So, Phil, would you say that this, the scale of this breach is as bad as it gets, or it could be a lot worse? <laughs> the, the, the scale of this is about as bad as it gets. There's probably not a viewer of this, uh, of this good TV show that hasn't been affected. Uh, this, this is unique both in its uh, scale, number one. Uh, number two, in the type of information that's breached. This isn't a matter of me simply having to change 
my email password or even email address. This is result. This is resulting in a breach of hard to hard to secure information. My social security number, my date of birth, and, uh, and, and that's that's a very these are very personal things. So it's different both in the the scope of the compromise and the nature of it. And what do you imagine is actually going to happen to all of this information? Um, quite honestly, the, this is uh, most likely to be a criminal event. I, I like to categor categorize threats into four categories. Number one, uh, individual hackers who are looking to cause mischief, do trophy penetrations of companies or organizations. Number two, uh, persistent criminals who are looking to make a buck off of the compromise of commercial, uh, 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 private information. Three, it could be countries who are looking to destabilize democratic institutions. Or four, the fourth type of threat is uh, countries who look to impose their national will against other countries in times of crisis. This probably is something in the category two, where it looks like a criminal element. And so it's most likely that they're going to try and commoditize this, this private and financial information and sell it on the dark web or other places. Phil Quaid there, Chief Information Security Officer at Fortinet. Coming up, we speak with Blue Apron CEO Matt Salzberg. His thoughts on life post IPO and the meal kit company's strategy for fending off the competition. That is next. Plus, IBM CEO and Chairman Ginny Rometty, our exclusive conversation about her vision for the future and for Watson and artificial intelligence throughout business. This is Bloomberg. has had a tough time since taking to the public markets earlier this year. Shares are down 46% since the IPO, but the meal kit company says it sees potential in partnerships in its effort to expand its brand. Bloomberg's Alex Barinka spoke with CEO Matt Salzberg at the Bloomberg Sooner Than You Think Summit from Cornell Tech's new campus on Roosevelt Island in New York. In Q2, and our IPO happened right at the end of Q2, um, at the beginning of Q3, um, it was about 3% of our network's volume. And Linden has been a big investment for us because we've been investing very um, aggressively in our supply chain in order to get people new products, more flexible offerings, um, new ability to monetize our customers um, with personalized offerings and lower um, infrastructure costs. And so Linden was a big opportunity for us and still is a big opportunity for us. We still expect it to be our lowest cost operating center in our network. But as we moved into Q3 with our ramp plans, we um, were a little overly optimistic on how quickly we could ramp it. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of work. Our business, one of the important things to understand is it's incredibly hard to do what we do. If you think about operationally what's involved with getting a Blue Apron home cooking experience to people all over the country, working with hundreds of farmers, we're growing ingredients, we're bringing them into our fulfillment centers, doing quality control, portioning, packaging, shipping, and delivering nationally in a high quality way, that's an incredibly difficult logistics. That's fair, fair yeah. point. But that's what your value you're pitching to investors is that you can figure out these hard yeah, problems. Yeah, absolutely, and that's what we're doing. Just to be 100% clear, Linden is about a startup of a new center. And so because it took us a little, it's taking us a little bit longer to launch Linden, we're operating two centers side by side in New Jersey right now. That obviously has additional costs mm -hmm. associated with it. Those are short-term costs because we are closing down our Jersey City Fulfillment Center and opening up our Linden Fulfillment Center. And so it's taking us a little bit longer. We are a little overly optimistic, and we realized that as we were getting through Q3 um, in terms of our ramp plans. But we're working on a number of initiatives, both short-term and medium-term in nature, to get Linden up and running and take on about half of our network's volume. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what we're doing. And you're having to do it all in the public eye. Would this have been something that was better worked through had you been a private company? Look, you know, um, you got to be a confident company 
and you have to be confident about what we're trying to do, we're very confident in what we're trying to accomplish with our business. Mm -hmm. We're building a company that's about meal experiences, about helping people cook at home, and going through a large industry that's in massive transition. As more and more dollars move off, uh, from offline to online, and as new brands capture share from old brands that are no longer relevant to customers in the world we live in, where people are looking for healthier alternatives, more participatory, emotional brands and experiences. And so um, we feel really good about our long-term prospects. And you know, what, is, what does that mean? That means, look, what, we have to do the things that we need to do to achieve our long-term goals. Going public, in my view, is one of those things that has helped make our company stronger through access to capital, through access to having a, um, the capital markets and um, a public currency for talent mm -hmm. and the like. And um, you know, we have to be confident to say, look, we know what we're trying to do. We know who we are as a company. And um, you know, as we execute over time, people get to know us better in the public markets and they'll, they'll appreciate what we're doing. I, I do want to unpack one other thing in that rundown that I, that I gave our audience here, this, the stepping down of your COO. And uh, to my understanding, there's a bit of a reorganization of the, the structure yep. at Blue Apron too. Uh, talk us through that briefly. Yeah, so there was an important reorganization that we were working on and um, completed at the time we announced that uh, my co-founder was stepping down. And that was part of that whole reorganization for the company. And as we're moving into this next phase of company life, it's more important than ever for us to be able to innovate fast on emerging consumer needs, on understanding our core customers who love to cook and want to cook with Blue Apron, but they have a diversity of needs. Mm -hmm. And for the first five years of the business's life, we've been very focused on scale because we um, saw a very large and attractive market and we felt the need to attract capital and talent and resources to invest in building a world-class brand and supply chain that allows us to deliver great products at great prices. But now, in this next phase of the company's growth, obviously scale is still important, but personalization and innovation on new products so that we can address new segments of customers mm -hmm. that we have historically not addressed because we've been focused and focused on scale and monetization um, in increasingly uh, stronger ways in terms of revenue per customer are focuses of ours. So what we did with the reorganization is we divided up some of the teams in the company more clearly to allow us to go after new product opportunities. Mm -hmm. We um, elevated Tim Smith, who's now our SVP of Consumer Products, and Pablo Cusati, who's now our SVP of Operations, to help divide those and help us accelerate our consumer products roadmap. I have to ask, though, the timing of it. This is post-IPO. You came out with a team, you pitched your story to public market investors, and then you turn around you know, just days, weeks later, and are reorganize, reorganizing the DNA of your company. Why, why, this, why did that decision happen when it did? Look, you know, we, uh, no company should sit still and do nothing. Um, my job as CEO is to every day do what I can do to improve the business. Mm -hmm. And our job as a company is to every day take one step forward. Literally every day we do new things, and every day we will continue to do new things. So um, in terms of the exact way that we have personnel structured and the like, you know, um, we will continue to make decisions when we come to crossroads and see opportunities to improve the company. And we're not afraid to make changes when we see opportunities to make changes. That's our job. You talk about confidence and trust, though. Uh, some of the, the buy side folks, some of the investors that I've talked to don't like to see these kind of changes so soon after you did pitch a narrative. How do you, and thinking back to that, that stock chart with your stock down 46% since listing, how do you continue to instill trust in the investment community, in your, yeah. your strategy Look, going I forward? I think we need to execute. And we need to show investors that we're doing the things that we say we're gonna do. And we need to continue to build uh, value by building a great brand mm -hmm great products, great supply chain, and continue to engage our millions of customers all over the country. And the, you know, we just gotta continue to prove that. I think people, as they get to know us better, will begin to appreciate the amazing assets that we built mm -hmm. and the strategy that we're going after, I think. And if investors say, hey, we don't want change, I think that's misguided because um, it's a company's job to continue to change in new and new um, market environments when they see new opportunities and you know, in fact, the weakest companies are the ones that are afraid to change. Mm -hmm. So I think our willingness to continue to change and evolve 
and build a business in a gigantic market and a gigantic market opportunity is something that I, as, as the largest shareholder of the company, quite frankly, am really excited about for our prospects. So you talk about making more money off of your existing users, uh, kind of focusing on that channel, uh, maybe as well as looking at scaling your core product. Those value add, talk us through your biggest opportunities there. Why are you different? Frankly, there are so many people out there trying to feed you. Why is Blue Apron different? Yeah, well look, the food and grocery market is one of the largest markets that exists out there. Mm -hmm. It's not a winner takes all market. There will be many brands and many kinds of companies out there trying to feed you in different ways. What we stand for is this love of home cooking and the experience of home cooking and the lifestyle around that. Our mission as a company is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone and people don't all know this, but the reason we call the company Blue Apron is because chefs around the world wear blue aprons when they're learning to cook. So for us, it's the symbol of lifelong learning and cooking. And this experiential participatory component of what we do is core at how we engage our customers. It's really important to understand, we think of our business as a branded consumer products company, mm -hmm. not just a distributor of other people's products. So we have to be great at innovating on products around customer needs and have the supply chain to be able to do that in a high quality, low cost way. Those new innovations, touch on some of those. Yeah, so there's a number of things. The one we just announced recently, as uh, a couple of things we announced recently. One, we've been expanding mm -hmm. our menu offerings to allow us to offer different um, combinations of meals to address different customer segments. So we have more recipes on our menu now that are designed intelligently to accommodate wider audiences, more flexibility for our customers, pick more, less recipes a week, any kind of combinations of recipes they mm -hmm. want. We also recently announced 30 minute meals, mm -hmm. which are meals that are specifically designed to be really fast for people with things like we might send you pre-chopped chicken mm -hmm. or um, a pre-made pesto sauce or just a recipe that's meant for a really, really fast meal. And we have some customers who want faster and some customers who want more discovery. When I hear that though, that does still sound similar to the core product, to the couples or the family offering, well, look, or at least it's the same meal time. Are there, is there additional value add, or additional sure. add-ons? Where does that additional yeah. revenue well, there's, come from? There's a lot, and by the way, the biggest opportunity is in the core of what we do. That was Blue Apron CEO Matt Salzberg speaking with Alex Barinka. Still to come, our exclusive conversation with IBM chairman and CEO Ginny Rometty, her big bets for businesses to use AI. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Artificial intelligence in business was a big focus at Bloomberg's Sooner Than You Think conference. IBM CEO Ginny Rometty is reinventing Big Blue to help companies use AI technology in the everyday. Bloomberg Business Week editor Megan Murphy sat down with Rometty at the conference and asked about Watson's impact on business. We're on a path to hit about a billion people will have had a decision impacted by Watson in some way. So financial services. Uh, and it's interesting to me to watch. Some of the biggest banks in Europe have adapted far more quickly to this. Customer call centers, uh, credit mutuelle. You take 350,000 emails in a day. You don't just sort them by uh, keyword for urgency and how to solve them. These are actually sorted by importance, sentiment of a client, their customer sat. That's what they use Watson for. And then what's the possible answer? Um, I was saying to Megan that financial crimes, you think people spend all their time decisioning. Well, if I'm doing a dossier on any money laundering, it could take me five hours to pull the data together. Now I get the data and I spend 15 minutes gathering and I do it. Um, on the weekend, I was with Woodside, a big oil and gas company. Everybody has this problem, an aged workforce. Uh, when you, many industries, I mean, I can name many in the room, uh, have this. And so how do you gather that knowledge? They use Watson to do things like uh, safety. 
making decisions on where to drill, all of that. And I was, I was just uh, actually chatting with someone about the weekend and the hurricanes. Now, some of you may or may not know this, um, we also own the Weather Channel, not the TV, all the digital, any of you on your phones, that's IBM actually you're hitting when you do your weather. And we've now introduced Watson into that. So over this weekend, um, three billion dots of weather info, a new weather forecast every 15 minutes recalculated across all three billion points of the earth. But on the weekend with, uh, with both Irma and with uh, uh, Hurricane Harvey, the most recent one, we helped a million conversations. It was interactive conversation, natural language, on how to prepare for the hurricane. And then it was a half a trillion interactions with Watson to help 140 airlines reroute. So these to me are things that you learn for business that are very different than when I think I hear people traditionally talk about AI. So Jenny, you touched on some of actually the criticism of Watson that's been out there, that it's still too dependent on human interface, that if we talk about in the health sector or we talk about financial services, mapping financial crime, mapping risk factors, underwriting risk, whether that it can't learn fast enough and it hasn't been transformational enough to live up to some of the dependency both of IBM and how it's being marketed. How do you respond to those critics? Well, I, I, if they're look, you know, IBM is an $80 billion company. And so when people say, my goodness, why hasn't this thing grown IBM by two? I think that's a very unreal, unrealistic, you know, expectation. And it's an era. And as I said, you teach these systems. So those of you that work with them, you, they have to learn and teach. And so I actually, Watson is exactly where we thought it would be. Watson is exactly where we thought it would be in a, in a great, example, and I think when you're a pioneer, people do shoot, um, not deadly, but they shoot. And uh, in healthcare, as an example, I remember when we did our very first oncology uh, teaching Watson, the very first was lung, breast, uh, colon cancer. And I remember the very first cancer, it took the doctors a year. Now, I have to, this is a really another key point about professional AI. Doctors don't want a black and white answer, nor does any profession. If you're a professional, my guess is when you interact with AI, you don't want it to say, here's an answer. What a doctor wants is, okay, give me the possible answers. Tell me why you believe it. Um, can I see the research, the evidence, the percent confidence? What more would you like to know? That's really what we're doing. And the first cancer took almost a year. We're down to less than 30 days now. And by the end of this year, Watson will have been trained on what causes 80% of the world's cancers. And so I find that kind of criticism completely out of line for what it is that we're working on together with doctors. IBM CEO Ginny Rometty there with Bloomberg Business Week's Megan Murphy. And that does it for this edition of the Best of Bloomberg Technology. We will be live from the TechCrunch Disrupt Conference next week, speaking to DFJ partner Steve Jurvetson and Y Combinator President Sam Altman. Tune in each day, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. And remember, all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays. That is all for now. This is Bloomberg.